Good afternoon and welcome to the Preservation Association of Lincoln Brown Bag Lecture Series. My name is Eileen Burkton. I'm the coordinator of these lectures. The videotaping today is sponsored by the Historic Preservation Fund of the U.S. Department of the Interior through the Nebraska State Historical Society and the City of Lincoln, a certified local government. Our speaker today is Ed Zimmer. Ed has been the Historic Preservation Planner for the City of Lincoln Planning Department for over 20 years. He's a native of Omaha and spent a decade studying and working in Boston, earning a PhD in American Studies from Boston University in 1984. While in Massachusetts, he freelanced as a researcher and a writer for clients including Peabody Museum at Harvard University, uh, Lowell National Historic Park, and the Smithsonian Museum of American History. Um, Ed's talk today is, our, is the Preservation Association of Lincoln's 22nd Annual Awards. Um, it's titled, And the Winner Is. Please join me in welcoming Ed Zimmer. Thank you, Eileen. I think this is the freshest winner is I've ever done because the awards were, were delivered two days ago. So we'll hope I remember it. It also gives me a chance to make right everything I got wrong two days ago. So it's a good opportunity. Powell always tries to choose a auspicious location for the annual meeting. And sometimes focusing on a project that's in need of preservation or celebrating a preservation victory. Um, and in the past, we visited Whittier before and after. Um, visited Whitehall Mansion on um, the borderline between University Place and Bethany Heights. Uh, Wyuka's Chapel. Uh, Trinity Methodist Church down on A Street. Uh, and one of the perennial locations for PAL um, the old post office and courthouse, the old federal building, or Grand Manse now, where PAL, in fact, was founded. And on the first years visiting there, um, the courtroom was not in its restored condition. And then a couple years ago, got to go back to the courtroom uh, in spectacular fashion. Last year, um, PAL tried a new venture and visited a um, kind of community cultural location, Lee's Chicken. Um, and dinner followed the meeting. And so this year, uh, we're able to continue that tradition with a visit to the original Valentino's location on 35th and Holdridge, um, which began as Campus Fruit Mart in the early 1930s under Josephine Gatto. Uh, her daughter, Zena, worked at the Fruit Mart before she married Valentine Wheeler, and they ran the a uh, little fruit stand, trying different business opportunities to make a go of it um, until they struck upon pizza. And in the late 1950s, changing Valentine to Valentino um, and operating on Zena's traditional recipes, they opened Valentino's. The building never stayed the same very long. It was remodeled in 1965, and I think we met in the basement of the 1965 portion. And in fact, we were greeted by, uh, by um, Tony Massinio, uh, who told stories of um, acquiring Valentino's with his brothers in the um, 1970s and the growth of the company since, um, and even conducted a um, trivia quiz for Valentino's gift cards. And we'll no none of us forget that every year the Valentino's operation uses 1.5 million pounds, millions upon millions, of pounds of mozzarella cheese. I've learned that if I want to attract a large crowd to one of my talks, I should have it at Valentino's, as long as they can be assured of food as part of the, me part of the meeting. So it was a great time and very, very lovely attendance. There are eight categories of awards um, that PAL gives annually. And we'll start with what they've called the City Center Award, which sometimes is a building, like Ann Burkholder's Art Colony in a Box at 719 P Street in Haymarket. Sometimes it's an activity, like Farmer's Market uh, in Haymarket. But those things that add to and enrich the vitality of the heart of our city. And this year, 
PAL chose to recognize two city center awards because they were so closely related and even close geographically. And one was the building on the right-hand side here uh, that was built by Daniel Hill in the 1920s as a little uh, commercial industrial building. And most people, if they remember it at all, remember it as a auto body shop. Uh, in recent years, it was a uh, daycare center. But just a couple of years ago, it was acquired by the Duncan and LeBaron families as an extension of their private art collections. Uh, Robert Duncan refers to it as an extension of their homes. Uh, and they display in beautifully rehabbed building elements from their uh, art collections. It sits right on um, Antelope, Creek Par Antelope Valley Parkway um, and has this um, spiffy new entrance to the building on the east side. I also like that truck that occupies the parking uh, towards the back of the building, um, an art truck, clearly. But I also like that as I explore that neighborhood down in the alley just east of it, it looks like there's some art truck wannabes there stacked up. Uh, we can step inside the building that they now call uh, Assemblage, uh, where their first show they called The Big Show, uh, big objects that maybe didn't fit in their homes, and Ed Sullivan greets you right as you enter in the building, saying it's a really big shoe. It's beautiful interior, very simple. They um, worked with what was there, which was very little, um, but emphasized the beautiful trusses that span the 50-foot width of the building, uh, polished up the concrete floor, and a beautiful space for displaying their art. And obviously, big things can fit in this building. So the first of the City Center Awards this year went to Karen and Robert Duncan on the left, and Catherine and Mark LeBaron on the right for Assemblage, their, their art building in Antelope Valley. And we're pleased that Robert was able to attend um, the celebration with us. And we also honored architects for the project uh, from uh, Alley Pointer and Cato in Omaha. Uh, and that's Mike Mueller in the middle and uh, Michael Alley on the right with Robert Duncan on the left receiving their awards. This building is at 1828 N Street, uh, just immediately adjacent to the big new roadway. And because there's another new art project just a couple blocks away um, at 2055 O Street, uh, and this stands just adjacent um, Union Plaza Park and the, the new open channel of Antelope Creek, um, Pal also wanted to honor this celebration of um, good things happening in Antelope Valley, um, particularly in the field of art. This is how it used to look just a couple years ago. And this is how it looks now as Constellation Studios. Uh, announcing itself with a beautiful sign on O Street. And also announcing itself with a beautiful east wall uh, facing the westbound traffic on O and facing uh, Union Plaza. Um, another simple interior, but beautifully handled and with a, a new skylight bringing light into this long, narrow building. It looks even better with art displayed in the building. And best of all, with people and art displayed in the building. And I think you can almost recognize some of those people if you work at it just a little bit. And this was opening night at Constellation Studios. This is a project of um, UNL professor and printmaker um, Karen Kunz. And it's a working studio for herself. Um, and she hopes to attract other printmakers to come uh, work in the space as well. So it, the presses are there and ready to go, and in fact, in use. It's just a beautifully handled building. Uh, this one, uh, the architectural work is done by uh, Barbara Marin Hacker of, Omaha, of Lincoln and Omaha. So I got some really beautiful photos to go with the presentations this year from these projects.
So the award went to Karen and BVH. And Karen here in the center with her husband, who she describes as her right hand in these projects, Kenny Walton on the left, and Dan Worth from Barb Mayer Hacker Architects, BVH, on the right. Pal has always honored a category of stewardship awards for major buildings that are beautifully taken care of, that are, that are in the right hands, and, and um, not always a specific recent rehab, but just a, con a, a continuity of care. State Capitol, of course, um, has won in that category, very rightly. And this year, um, Pal honored Sheldon Museum of Art. Um, just has passed its 50-year mark. Uh, the Philip Johnson Design Building was added to the National Register of Historic Places last year as it, it passed that 50-year um, ordinary timeline for National Register. A uh, beautiful example of modern classicism of the um, middle 20th century and one of Johnson's iconic museum buildings. Fine materials, beautifully handled, beautifully maintained. Sculpture garden adjacent to the museum, part of the museum. You know, we'll go in the front door into that beautiful space with the um, staircases and, and hallways passing right through the um, beautifully lit center of the building where light and shadow are always on display as art of their own. So Pal honored the Sheldon Artists Association for um, their support and beautiful care taken of Sheldon Museum of Art. And we were pleased to have Monica Babcock, associate to the director, um, attend the award ceremony to receive the award on behalf of Sheldon. Each year, Pal also looks at recent rehab projects to celebrate good things happening in preservation in Lincoln, and in two categories. Um, the first is commercial or institutional projects. Um, this is a view north from the Capitol uh, I think in the 1950s, and if we zoom in, we see a very simple um, commercial industrial building down at 14th and M Streets. It was built in 1927, designed by Davis and Wilson, uh, early architecture firm of Lincoln that still uh, is in business in Lincoln as Davis Design, now over a century old. Uh, and the building was designed for automotive uses, garages on the upper floor. On the first floor, in the corner, uh, those storefront, what's now storefront bays, uh, were not filled in, but rather were open, and there was a gas station under the corner of the building originally. Uh, this is when it was operating as a tire store in that area. Unfortunately, in the 1960s, the building was enclosed in a blue Samsonite suitcase and um, didn't quite have the simple dignity of the brick building it was built to be. Uh, the state of Nebraska uses the building as its transportation services center. Uh, it's their motor pool building. And exploring needs the building had for maintenance, for upgrade to its energy efficiency and windows, decided they needed to strip off that blue and see what they had underneath. And it looked so much better, even just in that investigation stage, that they conceived of a project to put it back in very fine shape. And this was the design um, developed for the uh, state building division um, by DLR Group Architects. Here's the cover peeling away and the building as completed. Um, not a fancy building, not a big building, but a very handsome, dignified downtown corner building now that we can see it again uh, and see it uh, well treated. I think it even puts in a better context, the other blue things next to it, um, having the red brick back. So the, the state of Nebraska, and specifically the Department of Administrative Services Building Division, the DLR group as architects, um, and um, the contracting firm that carried out the work, um, and that's Zach West on the left, Zach Mart on the left from Elkhorn West Construction. And then we have 
Fred Zerati from the building division, uh, Daniel Seathoff from DLR, and Rod Anderson, administrator of the state building division on the right, uh, receiving the awards. The next category is residential rehab, because um, residential projects are so different from uh, commercial industrial in scale and where they're located in the city. And big buildings like uh, Frank and Nellie Woods House on Sheridan Boulevard um, have been honored in the past. Much smaller rehab projects like uh, the Stake Bungalow, uh, the James Family Home at 28th and N Streets um, have been honored in the past. And this year, quite a simple house, but a wonderful project uh, was honored. And this is 1935 C Street. It was built in 1908 for a druggist named B.O. Kostka. Um, this is a B.O. Kostka bottle that I found on the shore of Oak Lake many years back, which will now be in the possession of the people who live in the house. Uh, this house had been converted into a triplex, uh, was in tough condition, was not being well uh, operated, so it was quite a, a difficult situation for the adjoining uh, residents. And some of the adjoining residents were looking for a way to take on a project and um, convert it back into um, an owner-occupied single-family home, and particularly Kathy Bailey and David Dinsmore. Um, and they approached um, a friend and benefactor, John Woolham, uh, who has the John Woolham Foundation. And he walked through the house uh, with them, and uh, I was privileged to go along with my little Costca bottle to tell the story of the house. Uh, and they partnered together to acquire the house uh, for 120000 because it was three units at that time, um, and then put in a considerable sum and huge amount of volunteer labor uh, and, and paid work as well to completely rework the plumbing, the electrical, take out all the windows, reglaze and repaint them. Um, David Dinsmore himself put in hundreds and hundreds of hours of volunteer work. Um, and put the house back in lovely condition. When I visited, there were washers and dryers right in the front entryway, um, which looked like a problem, but I think this photo also shows us the potential the house had, and that potential was well realized. Um, putting the house back in lovely shape, they didn't even have to list it on the market. It sold not at what had been invested in it, but it brought back, carried out the vision of getting a family home back on the block, um, well cared for, in lovely condition. Um, and Mr. Woolham said um, he, he knew that this was not an economic project. This was one he likes making people happy, and he likes providing Kathy um, and Dave better neighborhood and better neighbors. Neighbors rallied around and volunteered in the home for the tour of homes, um, and even donated for the landscaping uh, around the house. So a real neighborhood project. Um, and we celebrated Kathy Bailey and David Dinsmore. Um, Kat Kathy and David also celebrated their marriage that survived the project, um, and John Woolham for his support um, of putting a neighborly house back on this fine neighborhood street. And Kathy and Dave were there to receive the award. Uh, Kathy works with John Woolham at the Woolham Foundation, and she'll make sure he gets his plaque as well. Integration of old and new is a category that PAL put in a couple of years after the award started because there are some projects that really need to be celebrated that aren't a pure preservation project, but it's really what they knit together. Sometimes it's a new building, sometimes it's old, um, sometimes it's both. This was a brand new building honored last year, beautiful carriage house that Charlie and Nancy um, Ogden did in Piedmont behind their house, very much matching the style of the main house. This year, Pal chose the Canopy on Canopy Street, in fact, the namesake of Canopy Street and West Hay Market. And this is the 1927 Burlington Depot Canopy, the west one, the freestanding one that stretches over 1,000 feet from O Street up to R Street. In the original blueprints, there, this diagram of one of the posts that holds up that canopy roof um, is labeled Design for New Post. In the same set is designed for old post. And what that means is prior to the 1927 construction, there was a canopy attached to the old 1880 station. 
We think it was built about 1905. And in railroad fashion, when they built the new depot, they took down the old canopy, reshuffled the pieces, and put them in a new location. They were the north 500 feet, added to the south almost 800 feet of the um, long freestanding canopy. Um, quite neglected, quite needy, um, in uh, poor condition, the drainage had been allowed to, drainage system had been allowed to fail. It, if you notice from those post diagrams, it's a very shallow V-shaped roof because in rainy weather you didn't want water draining off your canopy onto your passenger stepping onto the train. So all the water would run to the center um, and was, when the roof, when the drainage would fail, was ruining the roof. Um, there are two little structures in the middle of the canopy and these were the head houses of the tunnel and staircase system that came under tracks one and two and brought passengers safely out to the track, the platform between tracks two and three. Um, these were in tough shape. Their glass was mostly broken. Um, they were rusty. Uh, this is one of the 1905 posts. We should have a trivia contest for whether people can recognize the 1905 posts, the 1927 posts. These are 27s. This was the north end, which has a special little um, terminus to carry the canopy out to the very tip of the north end. Sinclair Hilly was engaged to oversee and direct a very extensive project to rehabilitate um, the canopy. It had to be taken down and the lead-based paint that was falling off of it safely stripped off and then new, po new foundations, new footings put in for each of those posts 20 feet apart on precisely the same line where they stood before, but rising just slightly to the north end, so the north end of the canopy will at, be at the uh, sidewalk level for the elevated floor of the arena, which is five feet above the flood level um, at the north end. So here was the Hawkins construction, uh, careful deconstruction of the uh, metal work to get it out um, clean and back. Frightening to watch. Um, But reassuring, when I got a visit over to uh, the metal company that was removing that paint and removing it very carefully so that the um, texture and the trademarks and all the um, dings and bangs of the old posts were retained under the paint. All the footings carefully put back in the right places. The shelters put back. And then all through farmer's market season, we could watch it be assembled and painted. Um, and finally, the sidewalk, the canopy, the platform constructed underneath it. And it provides now a sheltered, lit walkway all the way from O uh, up to the arena. And with construction of the liner building on the new Lumber Works garage between O and N, one last segment will be built there. So there will even be shelter all the way down to N Street. And the head houses for the uh, tunnels were put back in good shape with uh, wire hammered glass. And on the lower portions of the two inner windows, we put back in photographic scenes of the rail yard in its early days. This is about the earliest photo of the old wooden buildings that stood out in the middle of the yard in the 1870s. And then a postcard on the other one from the early 20th century when rail traffic was so busy in the rail yard. And you can see on this also left a lot of the accoutrements that have been added over the years. Didn't strip it away back to 1927, but left a lot of the evidence of the railroad's long-term use um, of the canopy. And it provides the boundary now for the rail yard and the cube and is really the icon and the connector between a store K market and the new West Hay Market development. It's, it is that integration of old and new in its very concept. So recognizing the work on the canopy, um, West Hay Market JPA, the joint public agency of the city and the university, Sinclair Hilly Architects for their work, and Hawkins Construction 
for that very um, extensive and careful work taking down, putting back um, in beautiful shape the canopy. And Dan Marvin appeared for the JPA. Um, and um, Jerry Sire for um, Hawkins Construction and John Kay for Sinclair Hilly, left to right. Great Commoner Award is a category recognizing education projects or, or publication projects in historic preservation that uh, share great things that have happened in Lincoln with the community. Uh, named for William Jennings Bryan of Fairview Mansion. And this year recognized, many times in the past, Powell has recognized various stages of the capital restoration, the exterior restoration, and lots of great interior work has also been accomplished in the last two decades. Um, now that that work's done, Barv Mir Hacker, who had directed the work from their Lincoln office, celebrated the work and recorded the work and shared the knowledge gained in the work through publication of a beautiful volume about it. This is the Capitol in its early construction when the second Capitol still stood as they built the offices of the third Capitol around it. So eventually they could move directly from the second into the third and then tear down the second building to build the tower where it stood. Here's the tower going up in the late 20s. And in this project, scaffolding had to surround the tower again, um, all the way up and even encasing the sower as the sower was restored. And here's Dan on the right and Mike Rendoni in the center, um, way up on the scaffolding. 1999 portion of that work, early in the work. They, they photo documented the work with a very extensive collection. I think that's part of what motivated them to do the book. They had such great images of the work. And here, one of the um, sculptural works is being very carefully handled. Um, all kinds of crafts and trades had to be employed to get the capital um, back in shape. And here's some of the um, copper work being restored on top of one of the turrets uh, high up on the corner of the building. Rebuilding this entry stairs on each side. Um, and that beautiful work is now finished. We're hoping to see fountains appear in the middle of these courtyards, depend upon the legislature this year, as it's appended upon the legislature uh, always. So this year, PAL celebrated Nebraska State Capitol, the book. Uh, called Restoring a Landmark uh, for the Great Commoner Award and recognized BVH for that gift to the community. They published this book and then gave a copy to every um, county library in the state. And um, Jim Hanlon, who did research on the project, and Dan Wirth, who um, headed up the restoration and I think the book as well, uh, principal with the firm. Um, received the award for BVH. Every year the PAL president can also make an award, usually celebrating some great project of the previous year, something that really made a difference uh, to the organization that year. And one of the big projects of 2013 has been and continues to be um, Jim McKee's Complete History of Lincoln, which is now, I think, going into its ninth and tenth um, editions um, and will go on for a dozen, for two dozen or so um, lectures. A great series. But Powell also dedicates a large, large part of his budget every year to producing these um, TV programs and sharing them with the community on Channel 5. And stepping up to make Jim's series possible uh, was Speedway Motors uh, with a substantial gift to Powell and then to help support that gift. Uh, also sponsored a fundraising event at their Museum of Speed, and this was that fun event uh, at the Speedway Museum, uh, where Clay Smith talked about the museum and also some of the historic projects that Speedway Properties has um, engaged in over the years throughout Lincoln. And so the President's Award this year, um, here's, here's Jim McKee, um, and his wife, Linda Hilligus, being 
being happy at the event. So President's Award went to Speedway Properties um, and PAL President uh, K. Logan Peters um, was pleased to hand the award to Craig Smith representing the Speedway Properties um, and the Smith family. They also dressed alike um, in, in further honor and recognition of the award. I won't tell you which is Kay and which is Craig. That, that'll be up, up to each of you. And finally, the, the, um, outs the premier award for PAL each year is the Helen Busalis Award, named for our great um, late Mayor Busalis, who also was a trustee of the National Trust for Historic Preservation, um, was nationally known as a leader in historic preservation, and was under her administration, the Lincoln's Preservation Ordinance, and the tradition of having a preservation planner began. So I am grateful to Helen as well, and that she would allow us, give us permission to use her name on this award. And this year, um, we honored not one project and not one person, but a family, and that's the Sartori family, for a series of great projects that have contributed to preservation in Lincoln, in Lancaster County, um, and even throughout the region. Um, this was the farm, farm home on, in Stevens Creek, uh, that was among their projects, uh, their own home on Sheridan Boulevard, uh, even out to Odo County with the little Gothic Revival Church House, uh, and particularly, um, I think, important and precious to the community this year, uh, they took on the very difficult project of the Lewis Seifert House, one of the oldest houses in Lincoln, standing still on the university campus in the last traditional residential property on the university campus um, that had fallen to hard times, um, lacked the use, lacked consistent maintenance, um, and really was just in, in a world of trouble. And now, again, is a residence um, of Cole Sartori and other students at the university. It's the smallest dormitory on campus, I think with a present population of three. Uh, might increase to five, um, but it has constant um, maintenance has has people living in it. It's alive again, um, and that's what keeps the building going. Uh, if we looked at how the porch used to be and doesn't look too bad until you look at the floor that kind of goes up and down, and you realized if you went with a sharp fingernail and poked anywhere, your, your finger would go in, um, and now um, is back in lovely condition. Um, so Pal was pleased to honor the whole Sartori family because it becomes a whole family project. This one. Um, as Cole's present student residence was also um, the recipient of hundreds of hours of Cole's work, and he's the resident manager of the house. Um, so uh, we're particularly pleased that he was there. You will be able to tell by the photo that Kathy was there because she was not in the photo, and that's how you can tell if Kathy's present. Um, and we also honored then their stepbrother, foster brother, uh, Charles DeVries, who's been a centerpiece, along with other friends, but very much a centerpiece in each of these projects. So we were able to surprise Charles um, along with, so we even put them then in order of height, uh, with Charles on the left, Cole in the center, and Joel on the right, uh, receiving the Vusalis Award for the Sartori family and Charles DeVries. It was a great event. I think we had great fun. It was good food. If you want to be dining at the historic Valentinos, you have maybe a month to go. Then they will move all of about 100 feet to the east and reopen um, almost on the historic location, the historic parking lot location, um, in a new Valentinos, but still there at 35th and Holdridge. And so maybe we'll go back there for some future PAL award. And it was a good dinner and we had a good time, and I hope you have had a good time as well. Are there any questions today? Joel, do you have a question? Well, I just have a question about um, what happened to historic buildings in the 50s and 60s. Um, I don't think we dream of doing that today. We demolish buildings today. But we wouldn't dream of putting a big suitcase over the top of it. Um, what what does that do? There, there was a lot of damage done here. 
the goofy, awkward, and stainless steel casket under the facade. What came over people and what can we do to stop that from ever happening? I think Joel's observing that, that in the 50s and 60s, we sometimes slip-covered buildings and kind of wondered why and how we could avoid that. Also observing we don't maybe do that, but we sometimes just plain tear them down yeah. still. I think the impulse in the 50s and 60s was sort of like vinyl siding a house. Um, this will be a permanent, never have to touch it again, low maintenance cover, and it'll look modern now it'll look like the Sheldon. I think we were able to tell, though, the Transportation Services Building from the Sheldon, even if they both sort of grew out of almost the same moment. I think they were different ends of the same impulse, maybe. And it always matters whether things are done well or done poorly. But I think it also matters whether you recognize what does a building have to offer? Because that building couldn't be a great aqua building. You could build a great modern building in in the 50s and 60s, but you couldn't really turn that building or a lot of others that got those aluminum screens. Um, they are sometimes recyclable, um, so there's always that potential. And Joel asked whether, whether any of those slip covers ever stand the test of time, should not be touched. There are people. There are my colleagues who, who argue in favor of retaining important, significant examples of what I think of, maybe reflecting my view, badly rehabbed buildings. Uh, I think it's, I, I find them hard to defend for what they do to a streetscape. In a, I guess in an extremely varied streetscape, maybe it could be sort of a funky, fun part if it were a beautifully done slipcover, but I haven't seen one that I, that I thought, oh, gee, I hope they never touched that. There would be others who would argue for that position. They would be arguing with me, though. Right. So, John. Going back to the canopy and the two structures that were the head of the steps, are those tunnels, were they preserved, or was one of them preserved that came from the station up to that little structure? John's asking about the tunnels that passed under the railroad tracks and up to those little structures. The structures are, are sealed off. There are no stairs going down from them anymore. I think some of the tunnel structure may still be there under the track because that's a very heavily built reinforced concrete element. They've been closed off a long time. The railroad, in its last use of them, was running um, conduits through them and, and communication fiber and things, but they, they now are not serving an active use, I think some of the physical structure probably still exists because it would have been just very difficult and expensive to take out. But there, you can't visit those tunnels anymore, John. Neither can I. I remember walking through them. I, I, I walked through them in the early days before the station was rehabbed. There was a ramp on inside the building. There was a ramp on one side, stairs on the other, and those are floored over um, in large part on the station side. Um, so they're... They, they weren't a big, expansive tunnel. They were just a, a hallway underground to get from this spot to that spot. But a neat system. At one point, there was another tunnel led out to a little freestanding tiny platform out beside track five. That one went away a long, long time ago. But there had been even a further system originally. Well. The tunnels gave you the opportunity that if there were trains parked on tracks one and two, you could get out to load onto tr track two train or track three, and then with the other one, you could get out to, to track um, five. I don't know if there was a track six. I think there probably was at the earliest day because there were a lot of passenger trains early on. I'm not sure, I think the, the canopy roofs, I think, drain right into the storm sewer system um, because I, it's, it's all invisible and underground now. So I think they lead those straight down into the storm sewers, I, I believe. There is a rain garden feature that's being developed that in the old track one and track two location. Um, so it's immediately adjacent to the platform at the depot and the canopy street sidewalk, there'll be a little um, garden park feature in that space where the 
boxcars used to be parked. There'd be a little, little park feature in there and some rain garden features that will absorb some of the runoff in the area there. Joel. More of a, per a personal question for you. Um, I've never been able to ask you a historic home question yet in any part of town. You didn't know the home I was talking about. I know you ride your bike. I've seen you have a vehicle as well. You, there are thousands of historic homes in this town. You spend your free time just in a grid search, looking, <laughs> reminding yourself, I mean, how would you know all, what do you do? You must spend a lot of time. I'd like to just hear how you were able to stay current on what we have in terms of historic homes, where I, they're located, what needs help, which, are, which have been done well. I mean, a lot of the PAL nominations come from you, and I, I'm just be curious on how you keep up on this, because there's a massive amount of information. Joel wonders how I always can answer the question about historic homes anywhere in town. I plant the questions in advance. I only know a very, very few things, but I always get friendly people to ask me about those few things I know, and that's how it's covered, yes. Yeah, yeah. I know one answer to it, though, because people ask you, as I did, about the house that my grandmother and aunt lived in, and it causes you to find out about the house at 700 South 30th and what was the history of it? We, we've got a wonderful resource in the building permit system in Lincoln that goes back to 1904 and essentially gives us a building permit for every building within the city limits uh, from that time period. Doesn't cover University Place and Havelock and College View before they were parts of Lincoln, but it's a tremendous resource for being able to have the birth certificate of so many of our buildings. It's great fun when somebody emails or calls and wants to know about their building and you can right away send them off a scan of their building permit from 1905. Um, that's, that's, that's my kind of fun. <laughs> There's also what my children call that noticing thing you do, Dad. <laughs> Clark. The chapter, the book, you mentioned that the legislature is looking at funding for the court we're also looking at funding for the HVAC system. As a mechanical engineer, I'd like to encourage everybody to support the legislature in, in funding the rehab of the HVAC system. In fact, so that is one component yet that yeah. has to be done. Clark DeVries was pointing out that, that not only are the courtyard fountains up for legislative support this year, but also and I think getting, getting real good support, beginning of an extensive project to renovate the capital's mechanical systems, particularly the uh, HVAC, um, which will be another long project, but another one very w well worth doing, and another probably equally challenging or more so to the exterior work, which was incredible, but um, working within that beautiful building and the special finishes and fabrics and, and of that building um, will be a long but worthwhile project. I think it speaks, the Capitol, I think, was designed to speak well of Nebraska and Nebraskans. And I think the care we take of it continues that message that we recognize what, are, what we've received and that we're passing it on. And I think that's been the, the heart of the support for these Capitol projects. I, I think the I, I'm not sure just how BVH is handling the d distribution of that book, but I but I know there are copies out there. So I, I would I would check with Barvmere Hacker, BVH Architects. It's a beautiful, beautiful book, rich information. Thank you all.